Hey everyone, so we're at GTC 2018, sort of the end of it at this point, and we're doing a recap for news for the past 10 days or so. There's been some stuff here I'll be talking about, stuff we saw at the conference, Jensen's keynote, which was about three hours long and entirely on AI and deep learning and automation, things like that. And uh, I'll also be talking about a couple of other news items for the past week, CTS Labs, once again, we have an update there. We have some news on Meltdown and Spectre that we uh, got here at the conference, actually, some pretty cool stuff in terms of performance information and high performance applications. And then a couple of other minor news items for the past week. This video is brought to you by the Gamers Nexus Anti-Static Mod Mat. Our Mod Mat uses a high quality anti-static surface with a rubberized finish. We also have a custom paint job on it, which includes reference points and cheat sheets for PCIe, EPS 12 volt and other power cables, along with quick reference thermal paste application guides, a screw sorter for your video card teardowns, and it includes a common ground point and a grounding strap to help protect the products you are working on from electrostatic discharge. Order your mat now at the link in the description below. So first news item then, the keynote at GTC, the graphics technology or GPU technology conference. Historically, there have been a couple of launches here for GPUs. The Titan X was one of them. Nothing here this time. We did get some valuable information though. We had a video where we spoke with SK Hynix about GDDR6 and its inclusion on future NVIDIA GPUs. A couple of things I wanted to go over now that we didn't talk about fully in that video. For one, if you haven't seen that video, go watch it. But basically, the, the point we're getting across is GDDR6 is expected for mass production from Hynix in about three months. So that would be June, July timeframe. And Samsung's already been in mass production for GDDR6, so they've been on the way. Our understanding presently is that Hynix is supposed to be one of the launch partners for the new NVIDIA GPUs. If that's accurate, if what we've been told is accurate, then it would be reasonable to assume, short of trickling out GDDR6, that NVIDIA's next major gaming consumer GPU launch won't be for at least three months, since that's when mass production starts on the Hynix G6 memory. But again, lots of things to consider there. One is if they've been trickling out memory for the last few months, then they could still have launched product even if it's not mass production. The other one is Samsung is in the game too. So if they're the major launch vendor, things could still happen sooner than, greater than or equal to three months from now. That said, Nvidia has in the past launched gaming grade GPUs in the September to October window. And uh, if history repeats itself, that seems like it would be reasonable to happen again. They're not under a lot of pressure from AMD right now. They're not under a lot of pressure from their own architecture right now because they're still selling through Pascal, partly thanks to crypto, partly thanks to demand in general. And that said, I've received a lot of emails from you all in the past week about the lack of a pre-order button on Nvidia's website where they removed it and just said that the cards are out of stock now as opposed to enabling you to pre-order the cards for the next round. So the fact that that's going away, uh, as many of you have indicated, is potentially the start of the end for some of the Pascal cards that they might be winding down in production if they won't be selling them directly. It could also just be completely unrelated and coincidental. But either way, from the GDDR6 story, it looks like we're at least three months out, assuming Hynix is in fact a launch partner and assuming that information is correct. So we're looking at a little while for consumer grade GPUs. If you haven't seen the keynote, if you, I'll save you some time. If you are not interested in deep learning, machine learning, machine intelligence, AI, autonomous vehicles, anything like that, don't bother. The keynote will not interest you. If you're interested in those things, then at a top level, you've got a recap. If you're beyond top level and you need more, then it will not interest you. So a couple other things we saw here at the conference. One was a, a quick AI for locomotion and animation talk that we went to. It's pretty interesting basically talking about the usage of uh, AI routines to allow uh, pathfinding in animations and models and games as characters, NPC or PC, navigate their way through complex terrain. So we have some clips of that, some of it's kind of funny, but basically they create a reward system. So the uh, AI as it's training is rewarded with something, something good from the system, from the program, if it's able to balance correctly, navigate terrain correctly, et cetera. If it falls down, it does not get that reward. So it's basically a deep learning version or a machine learning version to get AI to train itself how to navigate terrain, but uh, whether that can be used completely independently from actors or whether there's a use case outside of 
crowd simulation, for example, remains to be seen. For crowd simulation, it makes a lot of sense because there's some physics there, some physical interactions there. Uh, think of Assassin's Creed, for example, push your way through a crowd, maybe some NPC characters lose balance, or maybe they, uh, they step in a specific way in relation to how you are moving through them. Not something you really want for a hero character. You don't want the hero character randomly falling over because they lose balance. But for crowd simulation, it makes a lot of sense. So that's something we saw here. We also talked, or saw a talk, about Meltdown Inspector that was given from somebody at Red Hat. And Red Hat's local to us back home, so we'll try and talk with them about this in greater detail. But of interest to you all, the primary impact from Meltdown Inspector from this talk was largely going to be on database. And from the standpoint of database, the impact is mostly looking at a 7 to 20% hit, performance hit, for disk intensive, IO intensive, and database applications, whereas more consumer facing applications, as we've seen in the past, should expect a much smaller performance hit from Meltdown and Spectre mitigation updates, whether that's software or firmware, mostly microcode and firmware at this point. So it's kind of good news for consumer facing stuff, bad news for anyone who does a lot of work with databases. We're going to try and talk with Red Hat and follow up more on that, get some one-on-one -on -one time for a future interview. But that's what we got for now. Basically, impact is looking at 7 to 20% for database, and that range shrinks if you're using uh, ret pulling versus IBRS, which I believe are some of the patches they were talking about, or mitigation techniques, uh, with ret pulling being a lot less and IBRS being a bit more 12 to 20% performance hit. Next one, so outside of those, we also, uh, I guess just recap it here, look for major GPUs, nothing at the show, sorry. Uh, we did get some good information though while here from NVIDIA employees, from SK Hynix, from others, and we have an interview going up with Tom Peterson of NVIDIA about ray tracing, and that'll be soon. So check back for that. Uh, additionally, there's some MSI Gigabyte stuff in the last week. We know, we saw it. We've been trying to loop back with these companies and others to figure out exactly what's going on in the GPP space. If you missed the news, MSI had a, a giant misstep and gaffe, and one of the MSI uh, India Facebook page managers for, for the MSI India page uh, sort of stepped out of line and made some comments that looked pretty bad, basically picking favorites with NVIDIA. So MSI has apologized for that. They've deleted those comments. But that hasn't stopped people from noticing the fact that there's a plane going over my head. But other than that, hasn't stopped people from noticing the fact that MSI's product pages have had limited RX series gaming branded offerings. Because of the current GPP climate, I think there's been a lot of speculation that it could be related to GPP. Uh, we don't have any concrete evidence of that. I have spoken with MSI. I'm having a hard time getting anywhere, and it's pretty frustrating. But the good news is I do have a couple of contact leads of where I can get some proper information because my main contacts have failed me there. But what I can tell you this is this. From speaking with people here, mostly off the record, uh, the Gigabyte product, the gaming box, the external GPU for AMD's RX series cards, as I understand it, for, since it's been in production, has been planned to not have the word on the box. There are two takes, takeaways here. One takeaway is that, okay, maybe they genuinely never planned to have the gaming branding on that external GPU enclosure for AMD. That's possible. If it's been in production that way for the last year, it is one of the feasible outcomes. The other is that Perhaps if we are taking the GPP conspiracy side, which may not be a conspiracy, we need to find out still, but if you're taking that side, then if GPP has been in place for the past year, maybe they just started planning very early on that and it's been in effect longer than we think. I'll have more information for you soon on, on all of that at some point. Still talking to a lot of people, it's a really slow process. Uh, the fact that this has been in the news now for a little while means that some companies have tightened down on talking about it uh, some people don't want to talk about it or genuinely know nothing about it. And so it's going to take me some time to work through contacts in the industry and figure out, is GPP legitimately as large of an issue as it has been made to appear at this point uh, or, or not? And I don't know. I don't have an answer. But I've been talking to people and I'm working on it. So uh, give me time, give everyone else time. At this point, that's what it's going to take because the story's out there. 
So it just takes a while to talk to everyone, collect enough feedback that we feel confident in presenting some kind of outcome. Either way though, Gigabyte Box, as I understand it, has been planned without the Aorus branding for quite some time now. That does not mean GPP didn't influence it, but it's something, to, it's a data point to consider in that storyline. MSI doesn't have an answer for me on why RX gaming stuff is lacking from their product pages, but they've basically said, we don't think we've had any gaming products in stock for a long time in the RX 500 series, so maybe that's why. I don't know, but I have a contact now, so I'm, I'm gonna look further into that. Outside of GPP and NVIDIA, well, sort of, uh, 4K 144 hertz displays will be arriving in April. These were shown quite some time ago, at least a year ago now. Never made it to market, but now they finally will be. So NVIDIA is expecting the arrival of the 4K 144 hertz G-Sync displays. They're HDR displays that they've shown previously. Uh, by the end of quarter one for their fiscal year, NVIDIA's Q1 ends April 29th, 2018. So we can infer that NVIDIA believes the new displays will ship in April. At CES last year, Acer and Asus both had prototypes based on a reference designed by NVIDIA. Uh, since that time, they've been able to expand on that and customize them. And the promised 2017 release window was delayed for unknown reasons, but they're coming out eventually. Acer's Predator X27 and Asus ROG Swift PG27UQ are both based on the reference design and were based on an AU Optronics panel, which specifically, if you're curious, is the M270QAN02.2AHVA panel. Next one, 3 Mark DirectX ray tracing demo. This will be a short one for you. FutureMark is launching a new DirectX ray tracing demonstration that includes non-screen space reflections. So a quick primer here. If I'm the camera in the game, that's my screen space, and everything behind me is outside of screen space. So if we have a shiny object in front of me, like a mirror, facing my camera perspective, there's an object behind me that is outside of screen space, and we have a reflection of the object in the shiny object in front of me, then those would be non-screen space reflections. So 3D Mark's working on some ray tracing stuff, uh, including some advanced reflections, and these should run on things outside of just Volta, unlike the RTX features that we've been told about, and they will be using Microsoft DirectX 12 ray tracing feature set. Uh, expect that by end of year. Also in the news, AMD's Radeon Rays. This was announced around the same time and GP Profiler 1.2, which is actually a pretty cool application. So Radeon Rays is AMD's Vulkan-based ray tracing engine, and Radeon Rays will use asynchronous compute in conjunction with AMD Silicon GPUs, CPUs, APUs, etc., to create real-time ray tracing capabilities. The engine is open source, and it conforms to the OpenCL 1.2 standard, so it can be deployed with non-AMD hardware across multiple OS environments. And also announced was a new version of their RGP, Radiant Graphics Profiler, and that will offer compatibility with RenderDoc, interestingly, improved frame and graphics debugging, and detailed barrier codes and improved frame overviews. So it's a pretty useful application if you're a developer and can make use of something like that. Next one, Corsair H60 Refresh, really short on this. Uh, Corsair's got a couple of new product lines in the AIO or CLC market, and the H60 is coming out, or out already for 2018. Has a new mounting bracket design, upgraded fan, and a redesigned pump and block and radiator, and the new look is identical to the recent H150i and H150i Pro coolers, but nixes the RGB lighting in favor of static white backlight. Last two here, Power Color's got a new Red Dragon RX Vega 56, and uh, no one's gonna be able to buy it, so. Actually, it might be available, I don't know. But Vega's been pretty hard to come by, also, so I have all GPUs. <laughs> Either way, uh, the Red Dragon version is not that different from Vega 56 in general. It's got a different cooler, it didn't disclose pricing at announcement, and uh, amidst the inflated GPU market, that's kind of irrelevant anyway, but currently the Newegg and eBay store lists, third-party retailer lists are $800, so don't buy it. But if it comes down, maybe it'll be worth it. AMD and or, uh, CTS Labs updates the last one here. Since last time, AMD has publicly addressed the findings of CTS Labs and has announced plans to mitigate the vulnerabilities. Um, a week or two ago, CTS Labs disclosed an alleged 13 security vulnerabilities for Ryzen, Epic, so forth and uh, AMD's chipsets even. And alongside those findings, crazy people, Viceroy Research published a 30-page raving report 
uh, brazenly declaring the expiry of AMD's stock, saying that it should be $0.00. So if you missed that stuff, go check it out. Uh, it was a vitriolic, insane diatribe of a lunatic. But either way, Viceroy pretty much discredited most of the stuff just on the basis of looking insane. As far as actual security vulnerabilities, we did talk about in our initial coverage, and some people seem to forget this, that the vulnerabilities themselves seem to be valid. We talked to security experts who discovered and advanced research of Meltdown and Spectre, and they all told us at the beginning of this whole saga, when we initially reported on it, that the researchers of Meltdown and Spectre thought the bugs, the exploits, to be legitimate, but their concerns were basically in the presentation of those exploits, just like those were our concerns. We still have a lot of concerns with that. It seems awfully odd and maybe financially motivated, though that's hard to prove one way or the other. Either way, uh, AMD did address the report, and in the report, they basically acknowledged that the security flaws uh, to some extent exist, giving a small amount of credibility to CTS Labs. And AMD kept it to the point. They basically said the following. Exploitation requires administrative access, of which, once acquired, many more attacks not listed by CTS could be perpetrated. The security threats are not related to the AMD Zen architecture, but firmware and chipsets associated with some AM4 and TR4 sockets. AMD's plan mitigation is in the form of firmware and BIOS updates from OEMs. No performance impact is expected. So basically, uh, although you don't need physical hardware access, you need root level access, administrator access to the entire system. Once you have root level access to the system, you can do whatever you want. So I, I, I think AMD's address of these issues is kind of like brushing them off to the side, uh, although they do acknowledge that they're real. But the fact remains that CTS Lab's presentation was awful and really looked like a hit job. So maybe improve on that in the future CTS Labs if you'd like to retain credibility. Either way, though, that's it for the news for the last two weeks. Uh, check back for more as always. Subscribe. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Help us out direct directly. And go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of these hoodies or the mod mat. But either one's good with us. I won't, I won't pick a favorite. Just one of them. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.